Hi folks, welcome to another Rock Poser Chats. This time I'm being joined by someone from over the pond, but not America. A little bit further north than that, Canada in fact, and that is none other than Lee Aaron. Lee, welcome to Rock Poser Chats. Hey, nice to be here. Congratulations on the new album, um, Radio On, which I must tell people now, in case I forget later, that it be out on Metaville Records on June the 18th. Well, where can we start? Were you planning on recording an album or was it something that sort of came about due to COVID and you were sitting at home bored? <laughs> so, um, that's a great question because everybody's recording right now, right? <laughs> um, well, first of all, before we launch into the answer to that question, I have to tell you that uh, the sad news is my the album is actually delayed until July 23rd, okay. um, the release date. And uh, yeah, we should be making an official announcement about that. This is due to the fact that uh, COVID and staffing and vinyl factories are uh, struggling right now to keep up with demand because everybody's making records. Everybody wants vinyl and they're down to skeleton staff because of COVID restrictions and various things. So... The, all the vinyl factories in the world are backed up right now. So the album will be coming out simultaneously on CD and vinyl on the July 23rd. But unfortunately, it got pushed back a little bit because of that. Now, the other question is, did I make an album just because of COVID? I did make an album because of COVID, but it isn't radio on. Okay. <laughs> so so we, started, we wrote and recorded, started recording for radio on before COVID. In fact... We were in the studio recording bed tracks the week COVID started. Do you remember that week in May, in uh, March in 2020, where things were not just changing daily, they were changing hourly. We were getting these crazy updates in terms of uh, how bad it was, how people were dying everywhere, how infectious it was. So there was the alarm level for everybody in the world was just escalating into like DEFCON 5, right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so we were in the studio trying to cut our bed tracks and all of a sudden, like, like nobody wanted to say hello. Nobody's touching each other. Everybody's <laughs> sanitizing like crazy. And we're like, and then finally, like my guitar player, who's from Toronto, we were recording in Vancouver. He's like, he's like, I got to go home, man. My wife's freaking out and our son is sick and my dad is ill. And, we, you know, it, there was just so much anxiety. So we ended up kind of cutting our bed track sessions a little bit short because of COVID was escalating everywhere. The good news is we got those bed tracks. We right. nailed them. And we basically went in, all went into lockdown and bumped up our home recording uh, equipment and continued to make the record remotely because we didn't really have a choice. Because right. my guitar player is from Toronto and the rest of us are from well, we're from the Vancouver area, but none of us live close together, right? Right. <clears throat> but um, after this album was completed, which we finished it up and mixed it, we had this crazy idea in September. We were sitting around kind of twiddling our thumbs and we had done a few, uh, we'd done a few like rocking from home videos where it was sort of like the four of us in the remote little squares of our world. And they, we put them together and we played some live things and put out a few videos like that. But um we're sitting around in September going, okay, what are we going to do next? And we're like, let's make a Christmas <laughs> album. So we actually re recorded a Christmas album in about six weeks and put it out. <clears throat> we put it out independently last year. Yeah. So it was only available on my website. It right. did, re surprisingly, extremely well. But um, Metalville has also picked up the rights for that album for this Christmas. So um, our Christmas album will also be coming out. Uh, it's called Almost Christmas with two bonus tracks and a new cover. Uh, this c Christmas, it'll be released globally. So there you go. The so the answer to the question is... would be an understatement. <laughs> hmm? I was going to say, it must be, I'm guessing, a very rewarding experience writing and recording with your husband. <laughs> I'm hesitating. Well, it is. He's... He's less of a writer than an, than he is an arranger. Okay. Um, he's an arranger and he's got great production ideas. Like we all bring, in my band, we all bring something to the table, right? Sean, get, Kelly, my guitar player, is kind of like, um, 
he's a motivator and he's an ideas man and he just throws ideas out like crazy. And I would say probably, you know, 20% of those ideas stick and the other 80% we go, ah, that was kind of cool, but maybe not, right? And right. But the good news is he's always bringing stuff to the table. My, my bass player, Dave Reimer, doesn't throw things out very often, but when he does, they're usually brilliant, right? So Dave might throw out two ideas a year, but they're great, <laughs> right? And then John, he's not really the guy that brings songs into the, into the, into the sessions. He brings in, like he's a musicologist and a music historian. We have a library in our house with over 200,000 pieces of vinyl. It's kind yeah, of insane. I, I have read that. It's like, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. So he brings that, he brings music history to the table. Like we go, like we'll be working on a song. He'll go, oh, you know what we should do here? We should do this. I've got this old Allman Brothers record. And in this song, they did this thing. We should do something like that. And then we listen and we go, ooh, that's a great idea. So John brings a lot of education and arrangement ideas. And of course, I always write the lyrics. I always write the top line. I also write a lot on piano and bring in, I almost inevitably bring in the ballad that ends up on our album. Um, and I do bring in a lot of musical ideas as well. So I, I'm kind of, I don't know how to explain it. I'm kind of the person that takes all of those that melting pot of ideas and turns it into a Lieren song. Does that make sense? Yeah, it so does. we all yeah. bring different things to the table, um, but I, I feel really blessed. I just have an amazingly talented group of people to work with right now in my life. It's my band is great. How on earth do you find space to live with all that many vinyl records in the house? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, as you can see, there are <laughs> no records behind me because you're, you're looking at video here. Um, we have a custom ad addition onto our house that's kind of like a small gymnasium. And it houses the, the, it houses the collection. It also houses my husband's media library, which consists of, uh, I don't know, thousands and thousands of DVDs, movies, which consists of live music recordings and classic and critically acclaimed film. We have a bunch of box sets like the Alfred Hitchcock complete yeah, box set, the Ingmar Bergman, Kurosawa, like you name it, we got it, right? Like um, we also have a library of music books. We also have oh, and uh, the CDs. Yes, they take up space too. Like he's got probably got about 12,000 CDs. It's, it is a pretty big, crazy room. But what we did is we've converted it into a library slash media room so we have a home theater in there which has been very uh, great for our teens and ourselves during covid because we're not obviously not going out to movies right so no i've got a home theater as well and that's been an absolute blessing it has to be said yeah <laughs> netflix etc <laughs> yeah i mean you imagine how would we have coped say 30 years ago with no internet or anything it would have been a whole different experience, I think, lockdown. It would have been very, very weird. Um, it's, yeah, that's interesting to say. Would mental health, I mean, I would imagine we might have more mental health issues because oh, of sorry. lack of things to be distracted by. But <clears throat> the, the argument, again, in, inherently is, does the competition and the, you know, um, things about social media inherently cause mental health issues in itself as well, because that's a big debate right now, right? I, I believe, mm. I believe so. I think um, social media is a double-edged sword. You know, it's, I, for my own uh, mental sort of, um, not stability, but to say myself going sort of stir crazy, I, I come off social media, Facebook, whatever, two or three months at a time, just to sort of have a reset. And you have to. And it's just that it come back afresh because otherwise you can so easily get sucked into arguments with keyboard worries and what, which is not good for your health at all. <laughs> it's really yeah, I good. I do not go there. And you know, it's, it's interesting. You talk about social media and sometimes I wonder if people may think, you know, oh, that, you know, Lee Aaron, she's 
vacuous. She has nothing going on in that head of hers because I do not use my social media ever as a as a social platform or political platform. Uh, I find it's it's a toxic place. And um, but I you know absolutely I have. I mean, I almost hung myself during the Trump administration <laughs> because I had so much anxiety <laughs> about what was going on in the world and the riots. And but I didn't speak out about it because it it can be such an unhealthy environment, right? And um, oh yeah, you know I, uh, I I you know I remember when you know Biden Harris won yeah. the election and there was a picture someone I'd seen someone posted it was. You know, it was a a gentleman with a masked up, obviously masked up with a one guy with a Biden Harris sign, the other guy with a Trump Pence sign. And they were shaking hands across the sidewalk, you know, and it was a very conciliatory photograph. And I thought, how beautiful is that? The two sides that have been fighting like dogs are being kind and respectful to each other. They're masked up. And I thought, how can someone hate me for that? So I didn't take a side. I just said, that's a beautiful thing to see that people are trying to make peace, right? Someone went after me and said, yeah, it's, it'll, we'll both be okay, dude. We're both white dudes. Uh-huh. And I thought, how did that picture become a racial thing? You know, it's just, so I've really taken a step back from ever, you know, posting anything that, that really expresses a strong opinion one way or another. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. Uh, for, for me, it's all about, I go on social media mainly for music. That's it. I'm not into, I, I, I tend to hide so many things or <laughs> as much as I can just so I can focus on music because that's, that for me is the most important thing. I, I, there's enough of politics and war and famine on the news. I don't need it on, on Facebook as well, getting drilled into me all the time. It's It's not good. It's not healthy. No, you're 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 hundred percent right about that. And um, you know, we've really <clears throat> encouraged our children as well to scale back. Have you have you seen the uh, documentary The Social Dilemma? Yes, I have, yes. Yeah, I thought that was really, really eye opening. Anyway, we're kind of going off topic here, but yeah, that's let's, right. that's, let's that's, continue. That's that's the way I like it. I, I, I prefer to have a chat rather than doing the stock ten questions because it, let's face it, everybody's bored shitless of those. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's like, what's it like to be a woman in rock? Okay, I've only been asked that a thousand times. Sorry. <laughs> Just check it. No, that's not on my list. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> okay, awesome. What I was going to ask is, was it a conscious decision to write 12 tracks for um, for Radio On, or did you have, I say, 20, 30 tracks, and b- between all of you guys, you whittled it down to the, the ones that ended up on the album? Well... No, we didn't have 20. You know, back when I was young and we were on publishing retainer from our label, we had the luxury of taking nine months to a year off to just write and write and write and write and write. And we would always have about 40 tracks and would whittle it down to the best 10 or 12, right? Um, We're all busy with our lives these days. Like we're all more mature people now. We all have, Sean Kelly has, a. we all have families. Dave has a son. My husband and I, John and I have two teen, young teens. Uh, Sean Kelly has two boys in elementary school. We we try to use our time. We try to have maximum impact, minimum time with right. our the way we do things these days. So <clears throat> what I do know about my band and the fact that we all bring different things to the table is that when we all get in a room together, magic happens, right? Unlike this whole process of sending files. I hate that whole thing, sending files back and forth because things get lost in the translation. And when you're not when you're not able to be in a room and make eye contact with a person to be able to read their mail musically, so to speak, it's just really different. And um, there is something really to be said about that. You know, I went back to college a few years ago and I studied neuroscience. And one of the things that I studied was about mirror neurons and mirror neurons are these things that fire in your brain when you are able to actually be in a room and read someone's facial expressions like it's an it's a, it's like a primal thing like yeah. you know if you're my friend and you have just found out that a close friend or your parent died and you're telling me the story of how you're feeling and you start to cry, I might start to weep too because I'm feeling what you're feeling because I can see you and I'm the mirror neurons are firing in my brain. 
Now, it's totally different than you texting me and saying, hey, Lee, my best friend just died of cancer, sad emoji face. It's completely different. And social media is making people less sympathetic, right? <laughs> in that way. But so I know there's magic when we get in a room together and we can read each other's musical mail. So I said to Sean and Dave and John, I'm like, hey man, when we when you play in Calgary and you're already three quarters of the way across the country, I'm gonna fly you back to Vancouver. We're gonna lock ourselves in the rehearsal space for a weekend. Bring your A game and bring your best three or four song ideas. So I already told the guys to bring their best song ideas. We went and locked ourselves in a room literally for a weekend. <laughs> and we just worked up the ideas and that's how Radio On was born. We actually worked up 11 ideas. We thought that was the album. Okay. And the funny thing is when Sean flew in to record and we that that basically our writing session was our pre-production. We didn't do pre-production. We just went straight into the studio right. a month later. And um, when we were in the studio, we, we I think we had about four or five days blocked out for bed tracks. And I think our third day recording when all this crazy chaos of COVID was going on. Sean and Dave had come up with this other idea, which is the song Radio On. And uh, we we put it down be, literally with just an iPhone memo. I took it home the night before we finished recording, wrote some lyrics for it. It was written overnight, basically. And the last day in the studio, we put down Radio On. That song, of course, is about mortality because we were we all had mortality on our minds, right? Because COVID was exploding and people, masses of people were passing away around the world which was so yeah and we were making music <laughs> i was gonna say uh, it must be you know working with these guys who you work with for years it must just make the whole thing so much easier you know you you just automatically gel there's a, there's no real effort involved to reconnect when you get in the studio i'd have thought they're like brothers they really are like brothers. Well, John is my husband, as you know. My he's my husband and my drummer. But um, yeah, they're they're like definitely like brothers. But I got to tell you, um, you know, for twelve years in the previous part of my career, I worked with a gentleman named John Albany for years and years, and I wrote some of my best songs and my most successful albums with him. And he yeah. left the band in 1996 um, to start to form a studio uh, in Nashville. He wanted to go on and pursue his recording career. Uh, as a producer, which I was 100% supportive of. He's a super talented guy, but that sort of left a bit of a black hole in my band ensemble. Then for years, I'd been trying to find the perfect replacement for John Albany. And I had had a couple of different guitar players over the years. Um, and then in, in 2014, seven years ago, I connected with Sean Kelly. Sean Kelly was Sean, Nelly Furtado's guitar player. Okay. Um, he's also played in some rock bands, Coney Hatch and Helix in Canada. Um, yeah. And um, he was writing a book about this lost sector of the Canadian music industry, the hard rock scene of the 1980s that no one has really acknowledged or written about, right? Which was huge. And he yeah, wanted to interview very me. Familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. Very with it. Well, Bright and Rock are very good friends of mine. So uh, you've kind of just produced some phenomenal hard rock bands but as you say there's a section where it it has almost gone unnoticed you know, on the record as, as you were saying absolutely and that was the focus of sean's book metal on ice i don't know if i love the title but it was supposed to be like metal on you know in canada right metal on ice so with a big canadian flag and the horns up um but he was writing this book and so we connected that way and we just seemed to get on like a house on fire, like intellectually and personally. And uh, he said, hey man, if you're ever in Toronto and you need a sub for your regular guitar player, I'd love to love to play in your band. And so this circumstance occurred where my regular guy couldn't come. And I said, you gotta, can you do it? And so he sat in for a couple of shows. And the moment like he hit those first couple of chords and we started working together in rehearsal, it was like so, glaringly apparent that Sean belonged in this band. And we were like, dude, you have to be in the Lee Aaron band. You're the, you're the guy, right? And, um, and that just, 
led into writing together and becoming great friends. And yeah, like there's definitely a magic chemistry I think we all have. But again, this is not just me randomly putting people in my band. I have worked really hard for years to find the perfect players. Not only are they great players, they all have other giftings as well as being a great, someone can be a great musician and can't write their way out of a paper bag, right? <laughs> they have no song ideas, right? So I have a great group of musicians that are multi-talented and they're also wonderful people. And that uh, that's, becomes more and more important to you as you become older because I've worked Very with true. enough assholes. I don't need to work with them anymore, right? Very true. You know? Talking of time, and I hate to bring up time, but um, when we look at, you know, how, you know, the years of your career, but it must be satisfying after, and I will say 30 odd years, you know, it just makes makes me feel very old as well. So <laughs> <laughs> since your first album, your music still gets such a positive response and reaction from fans and and critics alike, to be honest. Well, thank you. Um, well, there's a song on the new album called 21, and it's all about the fact that we are growing older and more mature and wiser and but in my mind I'm still 21 oh god yeah <laughs> <laughs> because it's like you know it's like my feet are falling apart I have foot issues from dancing around in high heels on stage for years but my brain is still stuck in its early 20s and I still um it's very very easy for me to tap into that and have that kind of spirit and energy in my music and I think the other thing, Dan, that um, is important, and I was just telling a, a journalist before I spoke to you about this, is that I'm still a huge music fan. Like, I love music. And unlike, you know, um, you know the ACDCs of the world, which I love, by the way, they're amazing, that can just keep making the same record over and over and over again and be successful at it, that's not me. You know, we're, we're a little more like, like the Rolling Stones of migrated their sound in and out of different musical phases like they almost were disco with miss you and stuff like that in the late 70s and you know their sound has evolved like bowie and i you know don't get me wrong i'm not trying to align myself with those artists or say that i'm as brilliant as they are no, but i get i get your point i mean you certainly dabbled in other stuff you know obviously you you know you've you've had the jazz side of your career as well something which maybe you know um, some people don't realize this. they think of you just as a rock singer but you know you've had that ability to successfully switch over to another genre something which not everybody can do well I grew up singing that stuff so it was very it was very authentic for me right and I still like a lot of it and you know all rock and roll evolved from old jazz and blues people, and like it, it was, it was all these old blues guitar blues guys plugging in their guitars like hello where do you think zeppelin got all their ideas right <laughs> i mean come on you know um i've said that many times you know that it you know it's so funny i think a, almost an immature attitude is that you know rock or die that's how i felt when i when i was 20 right that you know you're either in this camp you're aligned with this camp or you're aligned with that camp but you know um, I think the thing that makes artists unique is when they allow themselves to be open and influenced by other music. And yeah, I'm a huge jazz and blues fan. I love alternative music. I love some of my favorite artists right now. I love the Rack and Tours and Jack White. And I think Billie Eilish has saved rock and roll. This woman has such a unique voice. And the thing that's so neat about her is that, you know, I can totally relate. Like her and her brother did it all in her bedroom, their bedroom, their childhood bedroom when they you know and and uh, using you know modern technology and she's got all these jazzy influences in her voice and she's she's 17 17 or 18 years old it was right. it's just um it's not rock you know hard rock but her lyrics are very edgy i really admire what she's doing and um you know there's a lot of a lot of artists that i still love like a new artist that i love um i just got asked to do a project with the uh, Canadian Brass, and I'm going to sing a song by the weekend. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing I've said so many times, people are sick to death of me saying it, but I will say it again, is for me, there are two types of music. There's the music I like and the music I'm, I don't particularly like. I don't care what genre or type it is. I don't get embarrassed that I like X band or Y band. It doesn't matter. It, 
these are my ears at the end of the day, not anybody else's, and that's and that's all that matters. Well, absolutely. You know, you know, um, I'd way rather be a Renaissance woman than be pigeonholed. You know, absolutely. Do you think um, that female artists, uh, and I'm not just talking about rock, but, you know, going across the genres, are now in a, a better place when it comes to the music industry itself? Or do you think it hasn't progressed as far as really it should have done by now? That's, an, that's, that's actually a very complex and multi-layered question. Um, I think that the era that I came up in, that artists like, you know, Hart and um, I'm just trying to think of, you know, who else, there weren't a lot of women doing rock in the 80s, you know, the runaways. Um, we were battling against sexual stereotyping. You know, if you were attractive and obviously the, the agenda of many of the record labels in the 80s was to exploit that attractiveness, people went, oh, just a pretty face that sings. I bet they don't, you know, and it's like people would ask my manager, so who wrote the hit for Lee? And it's like, she wrote it herself. She's a songwriter, you know. She's involved in the production of her albums, you know. Um, so we were kind of battling against that. Mm. But I think we broke down a lot of barriers and we opened a lot of doors for artists like Shirley Manson from Garbage, Avril Lavigne, um, uh, Al Alanis Morissette. A lot of the 90s, Courtney Love and Hole, you know, a lot of the 90s women that came along all of a sudden, the door was open to be a woman that could pick up a guitar, write songs, be badass, and be taken seriously. So I'd like to think that we suffered through that era of, of, of you know, um, uh, you know, women were very um, sexualized in the 80s, right? Just pinups, weren't you, in, in magazines? Absolutely. You know, so, uh, you know, we suffered through that to pave, pave a doorway for these 90s artists going into the new millennium to be taken seriously. But it's it's almost like it's flipped again on its head where you've got people like, you know, Nicki Minja and, um, you know, Miley Cyrus that are taking it to another level of like, I should be able to be taken seriously musically and show whatever amount of skin I want to show. And you still have to respect me to the point where it's almost a little, you know, when you're writing, when they're banning Dr. Seuss books, but, you know, they can write a song about their private parts, <laughs> you know, with, the, you know, not a lot of, you know, heady lyric content going on there. I'm sorry, I sound pretty opinionated, but I, that's how I feel. No, no I, I don't think you're being opinionated. I think I'm, I'm someone who's... I'm certainly not pro censorship. However, I think the sexualization when it comes to imagery, etc., uh, for for children and girls expected to, to certainly image wise grow up quicker. And again, we're going back to the the evils of social media. Um, you know, it it is something that needs to be taken seriously and, and sort of like the 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 two artists you just said. You know. The, the, I, I don't, part of me doesn't want to say, but I think they need to dial it back a little bit at the very least, or certainly take some responsibility for, um, shall we say, the uh, the canon fodder that follows. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. One thing I was going to say to you, your vocals on Radio 1 are absolutely fantastic. Are you someone who's always looked after their voice? Because let's face it, there are a lot of artists from the 80s who I didn't know to look after their voices. And obviously, you know, time has paid a heady, you know, heavy sort of toll on their voice. But there's people like yourself who's, you know, still singing as good as you did when that from that first album. Well, thank you. That's really, really nice for you to say. Um, yeah, I have taken, tried to take care of my voice over the years. And, um, you know, that became glaringly apparent to me, and I've mentioned this a few times in the past, is I got really, really sick about a decade ago um, when my kids were little. Uh, it was a lot of it was just early motherhood and running about, trying to have a career, trying to do this and that. And I was very, very run down. 
Um, and I ended up getting a flu that turned into bilateral pneumonia. <laughs> and I had, and I also have asthma. So I was, I was, I was, I was literally on my back for three months. I was so knocked out. I was so sick. Um, I and had to see a respirologist because I could not breathe. And the result, end result of all of the medications, like I was, they put me on three different kinds of antibiotics. I was taking on these inhalers. And after my pneumonia cleared up, I could not speak. I was like this. I couldn't talk. And I thought, wow, I thought that was it. I thought I'm never singing again. What is going on? I saw specialist after specialist, and I finally got connected to a voice vocal cord doctor. Okay. So, and he took one look down there and he said, man, you have like vocal thrush that's not, that someone is missing. And it was from all the inhalers and stuff. Anyway, to make a long story short, <clears throat> um, I got had to get on some proper medication. I had to retrain my voice. He put these giant injections right into my neck of cortisone. <laughs> I know I was like very clockwork orange, trust me. It was very freaky um, to try to reduce the inflammation on my vocal cords. And that from that point forward, I was like, whoa, like it scared me pretty badly. And I thought, the only thing I have here, this is my, this is my asset. This is my instrument, right? So for the last decade, I have been hyper vigilant about taking care of my voice, I putting good things in my body, getting sufficient sleep, not, um, you know, just, it's mostly just a lot of really vigilant uh, self-care and taking care of myself, right? Um, and never, you know, warming up before I sing a session or go on stage, warming my vocal cords up really well, because it's, it's the same mm. thing, this is, uh, you know, you wouldn't go to the gym after you hadn't been there in a couple months and try to lift 300 pounds over your head. You have to work up to it, right? It's the same okay. thing with your voice. It's a physical part of your whole body, right? Yeah. Finally, and you'll be glad to hear that it's finally, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, so to the future of Lee Aaron. So any plans are sort of you set out that you want to release, say, an album a year, or um, you've already got a lot of plans written down for additional work? Um, uh, any plans for live dates and, and hopefully we will see you back over the side of the pond at some point because when we last over ooh, it'll be 2016 I guess for Rockingham would have been the last time you visited us uh, 2017 I played 2017? a show in London at a smaller venue in London and then we played in uh, the Robin or something in okay Robin in Bilsden yeah Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did two smaller shows in London at that time. We tagged them on at the end of our uh, German tour. But yeah, 2017, I I would love to get on a festival in, in England. Um, that That's my dream and that's my goal for coming back. Um, and yes, we, we are releasing Radio On this summer. The other thing I think, did I mention we're releasing our Christmas album as well? Again, re-releasing it this uh, Christmas and we are, we've, more than half writ written a new album as well so there should be an album for 2022 in the works as well so super excited about all of it just keep well, the, putting one foot in front of the other the good news is there are a lot of great new um rock festivals in the uk now so obviously uh hopefully we can get you over onto one of those or or more if, if we're going to be greedy <laughs> i would love it i would love it yeah, it's nice sometimes if you get a festival, it becomes the anchor date. It's enough money to buy the flights and get the band over there. Then you can tag on a few extra yeah. shows, right? So cool. that would be beautiful. Would be a beautiful thing. Well, Lee, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I mean that talking to you. Um, wish you all the success with the album. Um, certainly all of us at Rock Poser are really enjoying it. It's, uh, it's, it's a breath of fresh air in, shall we say, a dodgy time, I think would be would be a good way of putting it. Aw, well, thanks so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. Lee, thank you very much indeed. All right, Dan. Hopefully we'll talk soon.